welcome everyone. Uh, tonight, the League of Women Voters of the Hamptons are pleased to moderate a debate between the candidates for Suffolk County Legislature. They are incumbent Bridget Fleming to my right and challenger Linda Cabot. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, please silence your phones. Okay. But my name is Judy Roth and I will be your moderator. Will you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Questions to the candidates will be vetted to avoid duplication and to ensure they are for both candidates. The vetters are Estelle Gelman and Sue Wilson, co-presidents of the League, and Janice Landis from the Hamptons um, Civic Association. The questions will be asked by Maria Hultz from the Hampton Bay Civic Association, Bill Sutton from the Press News Group, and Judy Samuelson from the League of Women Voters. Uh, questions are written on cards, and you probably picked them up when you came in. If you have other questions, just raise your hands, and they will be um, picked up uh, from you. Um, we'd like to thank Aidan Campo from Southampton High School for joining us um, and taking part in this. And our timer is Ginny Poveromo. The League is a trusted, nonpartisan, political, national organization. That means we do not endorse any candidates. We do not uh, endorse parties. But as we are directly involved in the many issues important to our communities. Um, here's the format of the debate. The order of speaking has been determined by lot, and uh, Linda will be giving, Linda, Miss Cabot will be giving the opening statement. Each candidate will have a two minute opening statement. Then each candidate will have two minutes to respond to every question. During the debate, using a red card, which is on the table, each candidate will be allowed three opportunities to speak out of turn in a one minute rebuttal response to the other candidate. Then each candidate will have a one minute closing statement in reverse order of the opening statement. As the candidates have another forum to attend after this one, we will end as promptly as we can at 8 p.m. Um, this debate will be aired and taped by CTV, so you can watch it um, or tell your friends to watch it another time. So with that, um, we'd like to have um, Ms. Cabot start her opening statement. Thank you to our host for this debate. Okay, elections are about choice and Elections are about issues. I'm Linda Cabot, and I'm honored to offer a choice to the voters. The incumbent and I will agree on a number of issues, but we will also disagree on certain policy matters. No one should feel entitled to a position in elected office, and the voters deserve to have choices at the ballot box. Suffolk County government is at a crossroads, and the situation is dire. We have never been closer to the margin than we are now. We are at junk bond status. The New York State Comptroller has ranked Suffolk as the most stressed financially. We need to restore fiscal sanity. It's time for the people to regain control of the county and force the county to live within its means. Fiscal responsibility is the number one issue. We need a legislator who will advocate for the critical issues facing our region, who has a true understanding of what being fiscally responsible means. I have 14 years of experience at the executive and legislative level of local government. I served as Southampton Town Supervisor during an economic downturn and in a time of controversy. I took on the challenges and I righted the ship. As supervisor, I did the heavy lifting necessary to put Southampton Town on the right track and I have no regrets. Fiscally for the county, 
these are difficult times, and difficult times require people who have the fortitude to step up and do the right thing. I've demonstrated time and time again that I bring common sense and principled leadership to the table with a proven track record of reaching across the aisle to work with others for the common good, regardless of political affiliation. I hope to earn your vote of confidence on election day. My name will appear on the Republican, conservative, and libertarian lines on the ballot. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Flynn? Thank you. If I do this, can you hear me? No. No. Not close enough. Don't start my timer yet. Good evening, everyone, and thank you to the League of Women Voters, to Hampton Bay Civic Association, and to the press for hosting this discussion. I thank CTV for filming it so that everyone can see who's making a decision in this race. I am Bridget Fleming. I have served as your Suffolk County legislator uh, since January of 2016, so I'm running for my third term. Uh, I love my job. Uh, I believe that my career path, welcome everyone, I believe that my career path has um, given me the experiences and lessons learned that really allow me to do the job well. Whether it's managing my staff in a way that brings out the best in each team member so that we can really offer effective representation to the community. Whether it is working with partners throughout the district to find collaborative solutions to our very challenging problems. Or whether it's just conceiving and uh, drafting legislation that not only meets our goals but is going to survive the political process. This job requires skills that I've been very blessed to develop in a really um, lucky career in both the district attorney's office for a, almost a decade and on the Southampton Town Board for six years. My landmark accomplishments include the first sanitary code revisions in 30 years to move the nitrogen removing systems forward, millions of dollars in infrastructure and funding to support our local economy, great progress on public transportation solutions, climate change initiatives to increase renewable energy supply, and capital program, a new capital program to address region-wide coastal resiliency management solutions. We've made great strides in combating tick-borne illness. We're bringing back the vape flavor ban to make the governor's executive order permanent. And because of Narcan trainings throughout the district, I am proud that finally opiate overdose fatalities are on the decline. I've had many, many endorsements in this race. I think other than the political parties, I have the only endorsements of this race. I am most proud of this New York State Comptroller who, and I'll be happy to follow up when we talk about the budget, who has endorsed me because of his confidence in me. So thank you very much and I look forward to a good discussion. Okay. Um, and we'll not have applause between the questions because we need to cover a lot of ground. So the first question, which will go to um, Linda Cabot, will be by Maria Hulse. There often appears to be a disconnect between our representatives' stated support of environmental legislation, the enforcement of such legislation, and planning developments that are subsequently approved. Two current developments come to mind. One, Ponquag Point on Foster Avenue in Hampton Bays, a 20-unit condo complex approved in a flood zone on a polluted waterway, grandfathered septic in need of a cash infusion for construction completion, currently in bankruptcy. Would you support county legislation to require any incomplete project that is changing ownership to install state-of-the-art septics? Thank you for the question. Um, land use and zoning is actually under the authority of town and villages, not the county. But the county does control the health department regulations. And as long as an approved project does not have its certificate of occupancy already issued, I believe there's a way to legislate 
that when something like this happens, it's changing hands, it's run into a, a financial difficulty, that we can require newer standards to be put in place. And that's because the certificate of occupancy has likely not been issued. It's only, you know, under construction at this point. So yes, I would support that. Our water quality is critical and we need to do everything we can to uh, upgrade failing septic systems in sensitive areas, but we also have to be very diligent in understanding that the cost of these systems is substantial, including maintenance requirements. So it's one thing to be an environmental advocate, but you need to have measured leadership to vet out concerns on impacts on costs. Now in the case of that condo complex, that'll be borne by those condo owners and their maintenance obligations will be part of their maintenance and it's the appropriate thing to do. Thank you for the question. Ms. Flynn. Thank you. Um, I am very proud to have been a leading member on the legislature in the working group that devised and saw passed um, the first sanitary code revisions in 30 years to allow for the nitrogen removing septic systems. We have um, encountered some political resistance to some of the more stringent uh, requirements that we would like to see. In East Hampton town, every new uh, development or every new um, uh, building project has to have a state of the art nitrogen removing system. In Southampton town, it's only in critical areas. The, this old Allen's Acres um, is uh, pre-existing non-conforming uh, use with certain pre-existing um, rights, property rights attached to it. I'm proud that not only was I on the um, working group that did this sanitary code revisions and the grant and loan program to support it, but I personally sponsored resolution that would end the grandfathering of uh, septic flows. Uh, but if there's already an attached property right, it's not possible for that legislation to prevent that kind of grandfathering. Any place going forward, some of the restaurants that we've seen who are not complying, that are right on the water, if they do any substantial uh, re re, uh, what do you call it? reconstruction or any new construction, will no longer be able to carry those grandfathered uh, septic flows. I'm very proud of that, but I don't know that it's going to address the Allen's Acres issue. But thank, thank you. you for the question. Um, the next question will go to Ms. Flynn, and that will be by Bill Sutton. Fleming. It's okay. <laughs> I did that twice. Don't forget if you like me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so along those same lines, um, earlier this year, Ms. Fleming took a, a stance in a battle between Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone, a Democrat, and his Republican challenger, Suffolk County Comptroller John Kennedy, regarding 1099 tax forms sent to homeowners who had taken advantage of county incentives for installing new high-tech septic systems. Ms. Cabot criticized Ms. Fleming for being a, quote, mouthpiece for the county executive. Should residents who take advantage of the county grants be subject to increased federal taxes, or is there another solution? Thank you for that very important question. I chair the Ways and Means Committee, and so it was really, uh, I saw it not only as a member of that important working group that's devised these programs, but also as chair of Ways and Means and a former prosecutor, I recognized a real wrong that had happened when the comptroller issued these 1099s. Here's the setup. So uh, the county uh, and some towns, including the town of Southampton, have programs where if you agree to install a nitrogen removing system, at cost to the homeowner, um, the county will, uh, will fund the upgrade. So um, the <coughs> county carefully structured its pro program after Southampton Towns, which initially was issuing the check to the homeowner, and then once the town comptroller <laughs> spoke to uh, chief counsel at the IRS, uh, determined that the wiser way to do it is to issue the check to the vendor and then the, the money, fo the taxing responsibility follows that check and it's the vendor in their normal course of business who's counting that as their 
income for the year will be paying the taxes on it. And that's what was happening. <coughs> Mr. Kennedy, in what seems to be an effort to torpedo the county executive's legacy program that's going to turn around our nitrogen pollution issues, um, came up with this very odd idea to issue 1099s to homeowners when the vendors had already paid the taxes. In effect, double taxing Suffolk County tax taxpayers. So as chair of the Ways and Means Committee, I asked him to come before the committee and describe the reasons why under the tax law or under uh, legal principles he would make such a move. First he sent staff, then he did send, uh, then he did appear and agreed that he would not issue any further 1099s until he got an IRS uh, opinion. So that's where it stands now. It was a huge mistake. It was done to hurt the program okay. and there is no support in tax law for that move. Okay. Um, Ms. Cabot, your answer? Thank you. So I do support John Kennedy, our comptroller, who is challenging Steve Ballone for county executive. And it's strange to me that a county legislator would be criticizing the county comptroller, calling it wrong and odd and some sort of political move, when all he was doing was upholding the IRS tax code as written. Homeowners were receiving substantial subsidies for a capital improvement that's not expressly exempted in the IRS code. The IRS code needs an amendment or an IRS ruling has to be issued. So to protect the taxpayers of the county from liability, from all sorts of interest and penalties for not issuing 1099s, he issued them. A 1099 is a notice. It's not a tax bill. We hope all those contractors did in fact pay their taxes. But if there is any homeowner any whatsoever that paid more taxes as a result of moving into a higher tax bracket because they received $30,000 or $25,000 worth of improvements at their home. The comptroller, John Kennedy, said he will work on a pro bono basis with pro bono accountants to reverse that if the IRS ruling comes back in favor of what Ms. Fleming has stated. I believe she has undermined the program by politicizing it, by galvanizing it, by press conferencing it. Schumer himself said it needs an IRS ruling and our senator at the federal level should be working on legislation to have that corrected into the IRS tax code or expedite the IRS ruling. So to this day, she's undermining the program. Nothing should be done to deter homeowners from taking advantage of grant subsidies such as this. Thank you. Can I use my red card? Yes. Now I get to use it three times, right? Three times the red the first card. Time. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Um, first of all, it's only $11,000. It's not thirty or $40,000. At the town level, the grants are higher, but at the county level, it's $10,000 unless you put in what they call a shallow drain field and you get an extra $1,000 bonus for that. Um, the, uh, I, Ms. Cabot may not be aware of the, the entire background. It's a very complicated background, but um, you should know that there was a very careful memo from the county attorney. It was a multi-page memo that provided substantive guidance for anyone who was acting under this, um, under this program. And it said that you do not need to issue the 1099. Think about it. This is not that complex if you think about it. The vendors had already paid the taxes. And the comptroller said now the homeowners also have to pay the taxes. So not only anti-environment, but also anti-taxpayer. Why are homeowners paying twice when a vendor's already paid? Ah, oh, I had so much more to say. Okay. Yes, we want to keep to the time. Thank the you. The next question will be from Judy Samuelson, and that will go to Ms. Cabot. Thank you. Is this working? Oh, it's not uh, <clears throat> What would you do as county legislator to accelerate uh, the amount of workforce housing available? Thank you for the question. 
Workforce housing and affordable housing is a critical need on the East End and throughout Suffolk County, quite frankly. Um, we do need to work in partnership with towns and villages because towns and villages control the land use and zoning, not the county. So we have to work in concert with partners at the local level based on their comprehensive plans and help them to move forward the initiatives that are in their comprehensive plan for affordable housing. Through the health department, we can facilitate and use development right credits from already banked um, development rights from properties that were preserved. The key is that the county legislator does not control the affordable housing zoning that's at the local level. We need to facilitate through certain funding mechanisms, through um, processes for transit oriented development, and we need to facilitate uh, sewer district infrastructure in certain areas where we can see more apartments above stores as a result. For instance, in Southampton Village, affordable housing would be created where there is currently space and it's used for offices through a process of seeing that sewer district infrastructure come forward. I'm very much in support of that. Also in West Hampton Beach, I will give credit while credit is due. I believe our current legislator has been a good advocate on the sewer district infrastructure that's necessary. And I believe our current uh, legislator has been a good advocate on affordable housing. So again, I am always one who works across party lines and I do give credit where credit is due and when others have laid the groundwork. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Ms. Fleming. I appreciate the recognition. Thank you, Linda. We, I, we, I was today at um, ribbon cutting for the Sandy Hollow Cove um, uh, affordable housing complex, the very first rental affordable housing east of the Shinnecock Canal in the town of Southampton. That was passed after much, much discussion and revisions and challenging uh, uh, interactions with the community. Uh, back when I was on the Southampton Town Board, I said at the ribbon cutting this morning, it's one of the great sources of pride of my career. Um, on top of that, because we were able to pull that one over the finish line, it opened up a whole new avenue of approach for development of affordable housing. Under Governor Cuomo's Community Homes and Renewal Act, uh, there's $80 million that's been um, allocated for statewide affordable housing. Because the, the project at Sandy Hollow Cove utilized that funding, which relies on state tax credits for financing, we opened up a whole new avenue. We all know for years and years and years we've been talking about affordable housing, but it wasn't until we were able to crack that uh, limit on the financing that we were able to do it. We've got Spiant Commons coming up, Gansett Meadows in East Hampton is using the same <coughs> financing, so it's very, very exciting. We were able to support it with acquisition funding and um, uh, infrastructure funding from the county. So as a town board member, I was able to rely on the county support to say, one, the infrastructure funding is going to make for uh, clean water and updated septic. And two, we can say to our partners in Albany and elsewhere around the country and at the federal government, the town is working with the county. We are together on this. And that automatically gives you higher points on any application. So lots of exciting things happening in affordable housing. It's clear that we need thousands of units, and we're talking okay. about close to 100, but we're Stop. on our way. Okay. The next question will go to Ms. Fleming uh, by Ms. Holtz. Okay. The county relies heavily on sales tax revenue to finance much of its operations. The fiscal condition is not good generally by most assessments. While the national and regional economy is generally good now, the face of retail and the consumer behavior is also changing. How would you suggest that the county have a better fiscal outlook both now and should the economy go into a recession? Is that for me? 
Yes. yes. It's a great question, and it's an issue of real concern. Um, when the current county executive took over the reins of government, there was a $500 million deficit, a $200 million structural gap in the operating budget. And as uh, Maria's question reflects, Operating a $3 billion government on sales tax is a real challenge. When I uh, was elected to the Southampton Town Board, after Linda was supervisor and had been in office for 14 years, the town was on a credit watch. We had um, huge deficits. The enterprise funds, which are supposed to support themselves, had a $5.7 million deficit. That's the beaches and waste management. There was a million dollar deficit in the police fund. And we worked very, very carefully to move our way out of it. And, and by the time I left office, the, ca the town had a triple A bond rating, which it maintains to this day. So very proud of that. But the difference there is Southampton Town is um, um, budgeted on sales, uh, not sorry, property tax as opposed to sales tax. And as those property values went up, they were, we were able to do more in terms of balancing the budget. Right now, we've got to continue to right size government. Uh, we've got to continue to seek out uh, grant funding. New York State has uh, given us $10 million last year, $10 million this year to support the septic improvement. I've told you about the affordable housing support we're getting. I'm working collaboratively throughout the district, whether it's on on reducing methoprene spraying in Akabana Harbor or transferring the Shinnecock commercial dock right here to take that burden off the county which can't <coughs> afford it and put it onto the town which can more easily afford it and so can therefore really take care of it and keep that very important economic driver in uh, operation. We've got to look to thin the costs of government by working collaboratively and looking for other savings. Okay. Ms. Cabot. Thank you. So the question has to do with sales tax and how volatile it is and how the county relies on sales tax as one of its primary sources of revenue, unlike towns and villages where its property tax is one of the primary sources of revenue. Sales tax revenue is down because retail is down. Shopping downtown is not happening as much as it used to because people do internet shopping. So we need to spur something better for sales tax, correct? We need to spur economic development in our downtown areas. We need to encourage an experience in downtown areas. Dining and entertainment are experiences and people will uh, participate. There is legislation that's been moving through Albany and is um, moving to benefit Suffolk County and other counties that internet transactions will be subject to sales tax so that we still get that money coming back to support necessary government services. Clearly, this county is in dire financial straits. We're at junk bond status. There's seven bond rating downgrades, seven fiscal emergencies, a $3 billion budget that's unbalanced. One billion of that budget is payroll. The accumulated debt is $2 billion. 300 million was bonded out for pension costs Taxes and fees have been raised over 200 million. All hands need to be on deck, just like they did when I was back in town government. Some people will try to deride what I did. They will try to take credit for what I did. But the state comptroller's report does not lie. Councilwoman Sally Pope called for a state comptroller's report, and it indicated that during my time as supervisor, I took all the necessary corrective steps to put the town on sound financial footing. The adopted budget at the end of 2009 going into 2010 was my budget, and it clearly was reflected in the Moody's report as a sound plan. Thank you. Time's Thank you. up. May I? Red card from Ms. Fleming. Thank you. So um, I just want to finish on the budget because it is such a critical uh, part of, of our discussion today. You know, the legislature and the, um, and, the, and the county executive have different roles when it comes to that. But I am very proud of the way that I have looked for ways to reduce 
county spending, but there is no appetite at the local or state level to burden taxpayers further. We have never gone above the um, property tax cap, and quite frankly, the bond rating agencies want to see us pierce that cap, and we understand that the uh, local taxpayers cannot take on that burden. I just wanted to add in terms of the looking for collaborative efforts, we did the life rings on the, on the Shinnecock Canal with Southampton Rotary and Hampton Bays Rotary who worked with us to ensure that those safety measures were in place without further burdening the county, which is the steward of the canal. Um, I, I would like to, oh, also very important. Oh. No. Next, Stop time. Next, <laughs> next time. One, one minute for the red card. Okay, we'll uh, the next question for Ms. Cabot will be by uh, Ms. Samuelson. Oh. Yeah. Um, what is your plan to improve public transportation on the East End? Thank you for the question. This is a complex one because everyone loves their automobile. That's what's been going on. They won't get out of their cars and we have to keep making highway improvements. So yes, we need to do more to encourage public transportation. And I believe that the current legislator actually has done a good job advocating for our East End's public transportation needs. Very often, you are outvoted on the county legislature because there are 16 of them west and two of us on the East End. So yes, yeah, she has advocated very successfully for more time and attention for our bus system and of course the commuter connection. But we need to not ignore some of our other infrastructure we need to take a look at the timing of the lights on County Road 39 and keep traffic flowing. It's a common complaint that that is not moving in accord with what is needed for flow. We need to take a look at certain um, curb cuts that are out on County Road 39 where there is public bus and it's actually dangerous right by Sandy Hollow Road. So we need to take a look at all of that. Plus, we have to add bike lanes to our infrastructure projects as highways are improved, as we see our roadways repaved. The comprehensive plan update that was done many years ago with the work of Ren Dotson also to implement a number of bike lane and bike path recommendations should be implemented. And that's not just on town roads. It needs to be coordinated with the state and the county. So I, I appreciate the question. Again, I do agree we have many challenges that face us here in our region, but the most important thing is fiscal responsibility. We must get fiscal solvency for the county of Suffolk at this time. Thank you. Ms. Fleming. Thank you. On public transportation, I'm particularly proud. When I first uh, came to the um, legislature, uh, there were drastic cuts made in the bus routes. Look, we're a coastal community. Suffolk County is 1,000 miles of coastline. We're 2,300 square miles. Only 900 of that is land. We're facing um, storm surges increasing. We're facing flooding and other um, cat, you know, potentially catastrophic results of climate change. Um, I hope I have an opportunity to talk about a capital program that I've initiated to address that. But we have to get people out of their cars for the traffic congestion as well as the the uh, fossil fuel emissions that are threatening our, our way of life. So I am very proud. First of all, I uh, started a transportation working group that for the first time brings all four operators of the buses in Suffolk County to one table to work with the bus drivers, the bus riders, and Suffolk County Department of Public Works to try to figure out how we make an integrated system. I also have been to Albany every year since I've been in office and was able this year to secure an additional two million dollars in state funding for transportation. When I got the news, I immediately introduced a bill that which was unanimously passed that requires that every dime of that be spent on nothing but public transportation. Because of the noise that we've made, quite frankly, on the Transportation Working Group, the administration would like to maybe 
quiet us down a little bit, they agreed to uh, uh, be open to our input on how those $2 million would be expended. First, we're uh, beefing up two very heavily used uh, bus routes on the uh, west side of town, one of which was re run by Nassau County and completely eliminated so that folks who needed to get to doctors and employers, uh, em you know, to their jobs, employers could not use that. So we replaced those. But most exciting, we are going to be doing a micro transit pilot on the East End to start exploring ways other than those big, ugly, har par partly okay. empty buses to get people around in our rural community. Okay. Thank you. The next question will be by Mr. Sutton to Ms. Fleming. I'll ask the, the follow-up that I think you were, you were looking for. So Shelter Island is within the legislative district. Ms. Fleming supported a fare increase by the North, Fork Fer the North Ferry to offset costs associated with bulkheading and raising ramps to meet infrastructure challenges caused by a rising sea level due to global warming. What other measures, and this is for both candidates, what other measures can the county take to address issues related to a warming earth? Well, we do need to, and the most important thing is that we have to um, recognize that this is a region-wide solution. Anybody who works on the water, and I see Andy, uh, um, Captain Andy, I should say here, who's running for trustee here. There are a lot of, and I know there are a lot of folks who are here on the water, that any time you impact the coastline in one place, you're going to impact the coastline somewhere else as well. We have to start looking at infrastructure investment on the coastline, not only in a holistic way with an understanding of how the dynamics of the coastline system works, but also with an understanding that under climate change, with rising sea levels, increased storm weather events, uh, increased storm surge, we are facing very real infrastructure costs that we have to get in front of. Tributaries are being shoaled in. Uh, we're losing critical beach. We're losing critical wetlands, which serve an infrastructure um, uh, function in lowering storm surge during those uh, weather events and flooding. We've got flooding. I'm from Noyak. Every uh, road end, even on a full moon, even with just a high tide and no rain event, is starting to flood so that emergency services people can't get to homes on the coastline. This is very real. So I'm very happy that I, um, I got passed in just last week, a uh, new capital program. We initially funded it with $200,000 from uh, legislative funding uh, to initiate coastal resiliency managing on a re management on a region-wide scale. We're going to have to start setting guidelines and best practices for municipalities as well as for ourselves. We're going to have to start setting uh, priorities in terms of how do we make proactive infrastructure investments to avoid huge costs costs down the road as these issues of storm surge and rising sea levels continue. Very excited about that. And by the way, Shelter Island hadn't raised their uh, fees in the fares in nine years, so good for them. But they did have, they couldn't, the ramps okay. did not accommodate okay. the boats because of sea level rise. Ms. Thank Cabot. you. Thank you for the question. So yes, I do agree that Shelter Island Ferry needed that, that rate boost in order to invest in that proper infrastructure. We're at a critical crossroads in this county. We need to stop spending and doing capital program work until we get control of the finances of the county. So what we keep hearing from the incumbent is champion. I put this in the capital budget. I did that in the capital budget, this program. That is what you're charging on a credit card. That is floating bonds. What that is, is going out to the creditors and borrowing money. We're at junk bond status. It's costing a lot more in interest. We have to address the house. The roof is on fire. And the number one issue has to be fiscal sanity. Getting the budget under control, matching revenues to the expenditures. And if you don't have enough revenues, you must cut the expenditures. You would not run your own house this way or your business. So yes, we do need to look at climate change. We do need to study and take a look at different things. But first, we must take the next year, year and a half, and fix the county's fiscal house. That's the most important thing. Thank you. 
It's your third red card. Ms. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. It's good. Um, so uh, true that we have to keep an eye on spending. There's no question about it. First of all, bear in mind that the capital budget of the county um, overall budget is 7%. So debt service is 7% of the operating budget. That is well under our set uh, policy, which is 8%, and well under 10%, which is many, many municipalities. I would point out that when Linda was supervisor and when we took over, town debt was at $13 million, 15% of the town budget. We got it down to 8%, 15% was unsustainable. So if we're looking at ways to save money down the road, we have to look for where we can do it in a way that is fiscally responsible. We can no longer ignore what is happening. We have parks where, for instance, Smith Point will go in the water. I don't know if you've seen the pictures of Montauk Beach. Billions of dollars of commercial property are sitting on the water's edge threatened by climate change. We have to take okay. it seriously. Okay. Uh, Ms. Holtz will ask the next question to Ms. Cabot. Over the last 40 years, the county was a leading innovator on environmental policy with farmland preservation in the 70s, open space protection and the Pine Barrens Protection Act leading the Peconic Estuary into the National Estuary Program in the 80s and the early 90s, and water quality and nitrogen pollution reduction. What do you think are the next major environmental issues over the next decade, and what would you want to do about them in your term or your next term for Suffolk County? Thank you for the question. So, out here on the East End, of course, our environment is our economy. What's beautiful here is what's keeping us nice and strong with our economy and our property values. But again, the county is in dire financial condition. The top priority is not jumping on environmental initiatives at this time. We must address the county's budgetary situation. We're never, we're, the state comptroller said we're the most fiscally stressed county in all of New York State. We're bleeding red ink. We've never been closer to the margin. They're using revenue anticipation notes to pay bills. Contractors are not paid, but for months later. So again, environmental policy legislation wise, yes, we need to continue our efforts, but we can't keep putting capital programs forward and charging it on a credit card. When you have to look at it like your own house. You're at junk bond <laughs> status. You're not gonna keep using your credit card. Cut back, reorganize, bring it back to basics and then launch into the newer initiatives. So I'm very proud of when I was town supervisor and council person, which was for eight years as an elected official, and working in with the prior administration as an executive assistant, that we did quite a bit. We got the CPF in place here, working with our state partners, Thiel and Laval, so that there could be a referendum so that we could have this very lucrative funding source for preservation and now with voter approval that has moved into water quality improvement and yes i will continue the good work that that groundwork has has laid out my time's coming to an end so we'll pick up in a little bit thank you Ms. fleming on the budget um this budget despite the fact that um uh, County Executive Ballone inherited a $500 million deficit and a $200 million structural gap. Uh, this um, this uh, budget does not include any one-shot revenues. There's no borrowing from the pension fund, and it pays back $41 million of previous pension borrowing. Um, the uh, stress test that has been referred to from, uh, from our state 
comptroller, um, did not include, that was from 2018, so it didn't include a lot of non-tax revenue that we're starting to see come in. Sales tax came in significantly higher than was budgeted in 2019. We're seeing significant overtime savings. Uh, OTB is going to bring in $15 million that we didn't have. Uh, internet tax enforcement, which was just passed in Albany, represents another $20 million. So, and for the first time, uh, county uh, employees are paying into their health fund. So there's a lot of non-tax revenue that we're not looking at. I do have to say that when he gave me my endorsement today, this very same county comp uh, state comptroller we're talking about says, I have worked with Bridget Fleming for many years and I have always regarded her as someone who is deeply dedicated to growing the East End economy and holding government accountable. I'm proud that that's my reputation from someone who worked so hard to keep uh, our fiscal uh, house in order and I feel strongly that what the steps that we are taking need to be taken in the most prudent way possible but we can not ignore the threat to our long-term economy that we're seeing with rising sea levels it has to happen so we do it in the most collaborative least expensive way and we do it for the responsibility not just for ourselves but for our children our grandchildren and their grandchildren Thank you. Uh, the next question will be from Mr. Sutton for Ms. Fleming. So a, a uh, lighter subject, perhaps. Oh, good. Ms. Fleming supported a county measure that was approved last month to ban the intentional release of helium balloons in the county, a move that followed similar bans in Southampton and East Hampton towns. But does the legislation go far enough? Would either candidate support the banning of the sale of Mylar or other harmful balloons in the county? Our ocean uh, wildlife is without a doubt under threat from plastics pollution. It's frightening to learn that um, plastics are in almost every cell of every marine animal um, out there. And we do not know what the consequences of that are of that might be. Um, on, on a little bit of a separate note, I was just with Senator Gillibrand at Gabreski uh, Airport with a lot of other folks from the 106 Air National Guard and other officials to talk about her efforts to bring us more funding to deal with these PFAS, the uh, perfluorinated compounds that are showing up in groundwater everywhere. These kind of threats are very real threats to the public health. Uh, so it's not just a question of pollution as no offense, Bill, but a lighter note, these are real serious threats to our food chain and to the health of our economy um, because if our fisheries collapse, our economy will uh, be greatly threatened, but also to our own public health, the public health of our children who are eating this fish um, and the public health of, of everyone involved. So I'm very supportive of the, of the bans on uh, balloons, on the intentional release of balloons. I think what Whatever we do, we have to be very mindful of uh, local uh, businesses. And, and that's something that I think we can do. We can work together to ensure, just like we did with the plastic bag ban, that we allow folks to get rid of the inventory, for instance, that they've invested in before we tell them that we're not doing this polluting anymore on our ocean uh, coastline. Ms. Cabot. Thank you. So the question is, would you ban the sale of Mylar balloons? No, I don't think we should start banning the sale of certain entities such as Mylar balloons. I do agree <coughs> we have a pollution problem. People are putting trash where they shouldn't put trash. They should certainly not be impacting our marine wildlife, our marine habitat. The problem is when you start looking to ban certain things, you're reaching into people's lives and it's like social engineering. You're trying to control their behavior. So the specific question is, would you ban on a countywide basis, because we're, we're running for county legislator, the sale of Mylar balloons and telling shopkeepers you cannot have that? No matter you want to give them grace period for their inventory and so forth, no, that's not my mindset. I don't believe when you talk to our constituency and you go door to door and you talk to citizen taxpayers that these are top priorities. No, the top priority is get the financial house in order. 
okay? We're gonna see over the next three weeks a smear campaign against me. They're gonna claim, the Democratic operatives are gonna claim that I destroyed the town's finances. No, I ran a primary against my own party to take on the challenges of the supervisor seat, and I write it, the ship of state, and I, I moved it forward with critical people helping me to get it through treacherous seas. And clearly, the Moody's report, five weeks after I left off this, reflected that. I laid the groundwork where Anna Throne Holst picked it up. Bridget Fleming did not do that heavy lifting. Rest assured, you will see plenty slick, plastic-coated mailers like this coming out soon from the State <coughs> Democratic Committee and the County Democratic Committee. Mark okay. my words. Time. Uh, the next question will go to Ms. Cabot from Ms. Samuelson. Yeah. It's, not now. it's now from the Democratic Committee, though. It is. I've yeah. never seen it. Please don't, don't show that here. We're not. She wants to see it later. Okay. Later is fine. Oh, okay. Next question, um, how would you define overdevelopment and what do you suggest to better balance current infrastructure and resources with proposed development projects? How will they affect road safety, emergency readiness, clean water, our um, agricultural rural way of life? Thank you. So the question is generally, how do we protect ourselves from overdevelopment and all the negative impacts of overdevelopment on our critical resources, including our transportation resources? The zoning and land use is under the town and the villages, and they're guided by their comprehensive plans. These are under home rule powers of towns and villages that's not the role of the county legislature or the county executive. Our role is different. We are, we are involved with regional needs that, are, that are need to be delivered across many townships, such as the health department. There are certain comprehensive planning tasks that we do help on a regional basis to help um, towns and villages uh, avoid overdevelopment ills and encourage sprawl. But guess what? A mayor and trustee and a town board with the supervisor can ignore any advice of the county because they have the home rule powers to decide where to put what, what to zone what. So the key is to, if you're concerned about these things, is make sure you have very good people on town board representing you. I'm proud of my record as former supervisor and councilwoman. I closed loopholes in our zoning code. I sh marshaled the resources necessary for many Hamlet studies and updated the comprehensive plan. I have a lot of experience in land use and zoning, and I will bring that to the forefront as a county legislator, as an experienced person. However, the question is more geared towards supervisor and town board candidates because you're asking to preserve and protect from overdevelopment at the local level. Thank you. Ms. Fleming. Yes, thank you. No matter where you are in government, you have to keep your eye on goals and priorities and ensure that you're acting in a way that's consistent with those goals and priorities. So first, it's very important to be in these rooms and talk to folks in the community, um, which I'm very pleased to have lots of great relationships now after almost 10 years in public service. But then you have to be uh, mindful of what the role is the particular role that you're playing. As a Suffolk County legislator, um, the way that we can help with regard to responsible development, development that doesn't overstretch its burdens, is first of all to look at opportunities that I, I identified because I was on the Southampton Town Board. We talked about Allen's Acres and some of the other restaurants that are blowing through um, the normal septic code because they're pre-existing. I 
eliminated that. There are, there's no more grandfathering for that. So there's one place where development can't go out of control. The other really important thing that I want to tell you about is Al Krupski and I, he's my partner on the North Fork. Um, and by the way, it's true that there are two of us on the East End and, and 18 all together on the legislature, but Al always says he feels sorry for them because there's only 16 of them. <laughs> 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 but at any rate, <laughs> that's Al's joke. But, um, but um, with regard to the septic program that we set up, there was a real fear that if we were going to be allowing for additional septic flow, we were going to be inviting overdevelopment, which is not desired on the east end of Long Island. We do not want to turn into my friend's districts up in Huntington and Islip. Um, so we, Al and I, ensured, because we were both on that working group, we made sure that the legislation includes specific provisions that takes these advanced septic treatment, uh, which allow for greater wastewater treatment out of the sewer code and made sure that in the language, which is pretty arcane, you cannot rely on the fact that there's more septic treatment to overdevelop. I'm very okay. proud of that. Okay. So we're now, uh, the last two questions, um, the first one will be asked by uh, Ms. Hulse and that will go to Ms. Fleming. There's community frustration regarding the perceived lack of communication on multiple fronts between the county, town, and Hampton Bay's residents, particularly on the issue of traffic. It was the subject of discussion at a Southampton Town Board debate hosted by the HBCA held on 923. How would you facilitate improved communications and planning between the county, town, and hamlet? Two examples of traffic communication frustration. Number one, the redevelopment of Montauk Highway by CPI. The county gave land to CPI and has created a roadblock that lasts for over an hour on a normal day and the multi-year lack of addressing safety concerns regarding access to the atrium professional complex at the corner of Montauk Highway and Route 24. There's at okay. least an accident a week. Ms. Fleming. Thank you. Yes, I was very aware of the discussion around the construction. Um, <laughs> smile. We were all very aware of it and I have some of my great staff here who's also very aware of it and have been working on it. We did a request for a traffic study there on County Road 30, uh, 80, Montauk Highway where it goes under the trestle, before you go under the trestle. Um, and what DPW told us, the chief engineer at DPW assured us that they'll continue to make observations as the construction moves um, through to completion. I'm going to stay on top of it. It's not a satisfying answer to me either. One thing that I did uh, ensure was that they were going to keep emergency services in mind and the passage of emergency services as they do this. But what Mr. Hillman basically said to me was that um, as the construction progresses, the problem is there and they're going to start to deal with it as the construction gets closer and they can do actual changes. I am going to push for changes, but they don't want to do it yet because they think that they won't get it right if construction isn't finished. On the atrium, I'll have to get back to you on that. But I do, because I didn't have that on my list. But, um, but I do want to just say that we, we, I passed a bill a couple of years ago uh, that requires that uh, the county DPW give notice to uh, town and village officials when they're doing any kind of infrastructure improvements. So at the very least, your town board and any uh, local um, officials should get a heads up so that they can have some input. On Springs Fireplace Road, on Bridgehampton Turnpike, um, uh, I'm blanking on the other. There, we had a number of big infrastructure projects that have happened since I've been on the town board, I mean, on the legislature, where we've had really good communication with the community. So we can invite that again. I'm, I'm having a tough answer on the, on, from Bill Hillman on the uh, County you. Road 80, but we're going to continue okay. to follow it up. Thank you. Ms. Cabot. Thank you for the question. You know, Hampton Bays long feels it's been forgotten. It needs a lot of time and attention and coordination from different levels of government. We have a very long commercial corridor. It's a county road. And clearly, 
that county road and communication regarding improvements needs to be coordinated with our citizens locally too who kind of know better sometimes they do these studies and they do them in the off time and it's all wrong I, I was actually against the new condos that are going up where Riptide used to be and Aldenkirk's. I didn't like that planned development district and I think it's a nightmare with the traffic pattern in that area. I think it is a disaster and I think that this redesign is wrong. And I really think that we need to see the DPW come and sit and watch it all day long, especially during the morning commute heading east and the morning commute heading west. And we have to see how that traffic light at Canoe Place Road has changed how things travel, especially in the morning. We know that people go around and go down Gravel Hill Road and all the way to Canoe Place Road. It impacts our town roads as a result. So clearly the county, which has very large infrastructure in uh, Hampton Bays, I mean, this is over three miles of county road, probably close to five miles. And then when they pave it, they don't pave it the whole stretch of it. They kind of just stop. You know, you need to budget to get the whole thing done correctly. And when you're putting in sidewalks, continue the connections so that we don't have um, dirt, you know, situations, especially when it's near a shopping center. People are going on foot. It is critical that we keep them safe on the sides. If I am elected, certainly I will be paying attention to these quality of life issues. These are things that impact us as families. Thank you. Um, the last question, uh, we'll start with Ms. Cabot and it'll be asked by Mr. Sutton. Ms. Fleming sponsored legislation to create a community choice aggregation or CCA task force in the county in an effort, she said, to give residents a choice as far as energy suppliers and better local control. Uh, can, can we explain how such a plan would work and would both candidates be in favor of creating a CCA system? To be honest, I'm not familiar with it, so I would defer to the incumbent. I don't know what she's proposing. I'm not sure what she's looking to do. Is this something to push towards renewable energy, for instance? Um, so I would defer to her, and if I need to respond, I have a red card since it's 8 o'clock, and I haven't used a single red card. Ms. <laughs> Fleming, thank tell you. us about that. Thank, yes, thank you for bringing that up. It's so hard to, we have a very, very busy team in my district office, and it's hard to get everything out in this forum. But I am very, very proud of having created a community choice aggregation task force that is a group of uh, experts in the area of energy supply who I brought together to advise the town of Southampton, the town of East Hampton, perhaps Huntington and Brookhaven on community choice aggregation. Community choice aggregation is a model for energy supply that was authorized by a rule uh, by the Public Service Commission uh, in Albany that allows uh, communities to aggregate their buying power as individual customers and make a choice as to where their energy supply is coming from. So you don't have to get it from LIPA and PSEG for two reasons. One, the, in, in many communities, including Westchester, they've seen considerable savings. Our electric rates are higher than almost anywhere in the nation, except maybe Hawaii, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, but even if we can't find savings from it, it'll allow us to increase the amount of sustainable uh, supply of energy. So we are a coastal community. We have to start fighting uh, fossil fuel emissions and get back on some sustainable track with regard to our environment. This gives us the opportunity to do that. The challenge is that um, the Public Service Commission doesn't have um, a regulatory authority over our utilities. We have these unique utility regulatory structure for LIPA and PSEG. So whereas elsewhere in the state, folks who have the will, the collective will to enter into a community choice aggregation model can do so by going to the Public Service Commission with a petition. In our community, we can't because they're not subject to that authority. So it's my hope, because Southampton Town mm -hmm. and East Hampton Town have both passed this, that we can be sort of the 800 
hundred pound gorilla right. in the room and get LIPA and PSEG yeah. to agree yeah. or to work okay. with us so to do the CCA model. Okay. Thank you. So let's keep, keep on. Uh, red card? No? Sure. Might as okay. well use it, right? I'll talk for a minute. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you for forming a task force on that. I think we need to do a lot more than form task force and talk about climate change and talk about renewable energy. We need to really hunker down and take a look at what are our critical functions in county government and how do we fund them and how do we get to solvency. Once we get to solvency, then we can do more capital programs and invest in the different studies and infrastructure that you might want to move forward with because your bond rating will improve and it won't cost our taxpayers triple the amount in, in interest and so forth. You know, this is a good question. I do appreciate it. I'm not familiar with it, but I want to talk in general about uh, renewable energy for a moment. You know, I'm in favor of renewable energy and getting off the grid. I'm in favor of moving forward in a progressive way. On solar, what happened to solar? Why are we doing offshore wind in Montauk? And I'm not in favor of offshore wind in Montauk due to impacts to our commercial fisheries. By the way, I have another okay. red card. <laughs> I want to you, continue talking. You do. No? Yes, no? There is, yes, you have another red okay, card. Okay, thank you. So I want to I want to talk about why I'm not in favor. This is our only public debate as county legislators. This is a large district. It runs from Mauritius to Montauk and includes Shelter Island. And one of the big issues out in East Hampton is this South Fork wind farm, which actually is two different wind farms. They piggyback to each other. They're very substantial. It's exciting to actually talk about wind power, but what we need to do is not negatively impact our marine habitat, our maritime heritage. I'm concerned for the fisheries. I'm concerned for large piles being driven into the ocean floor, negatively impacting whales, dolphins, and all the rest. We need to have every level of government advocating for the extensive environmental studies necessary and the mitigative measures that are necessary if that's to move forward. And by the way, the governor has it on a runaway train to get in place for next year. Thank you. Okay, um, so now we will move to our closing statements and uh, Ms. Fleming uh, will give her closing statement. Thank you, and would you like us to stand? Yeah, time is going. Uh, Thank you very much. This has been a really good discussion. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of the evening, I am very, very proud of the work that I've done. I love my job. And one of the great things like, that I share with my colleague, Al Krebsky, is years in service to uh, town government. Because what that does is how many times have I been here in Hampton Bays talking to the folks who care about Hampton Bays so then when I get to the county legislature, I can say we got we, we to gotta transfer for the Shinnecock Dock. We've got to do the things that are, are required. And I am very proud of being able to do these things without much cost to the county. So the CCA task force, completely no cost. These are volunteers who are coming forward to help the rest of the community work to reduce their utility costs. I'm very proud of the brief that I um, sponsored a bill to get filed in the summer flounder quota for okay. the uh, Attorney General, and thank you for your attention and your time. I would ask that you reelect me. I love what I do, and I'm open in any time to representing this wonderful community. Okay. And thank you, Judy. Cabot. Thank you again for hosting this forum. We have many challenges that face us, but without fiscal solvency, we are doomed. Suffolk County is bleeding red ink. It's time to stop kicking the can down the road and pull Suffolk County back from the brink of financial disaster. We need to elect community servants who are not afraid to make the hard choices to cut spending, to reduce accumulated debt, to eliminate operating deficits. <laughs> this will not be easy with special interests pushing back like the tail that wags the dog. I support John Kennedy for county executive because he represents our best chance that this county has to address the dire financial situation and reverse the years 
of financial mismanagement. The loan's been there for eight years. There are many challenges that face us regionally, affordable housing, water quality, economic development, transportation, and public safety. But fiscal responsibility is number one. Respectfully, I ask for your vote of confidence on election day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both. And I just want to remind the audience, um, election day is November 5th. But for the first time, New York State has early voting. That means that you can vote um, from October 26th through November 3rd. The sheets are up there at the table. And we encourage you to do this because it's going to be, this is really a trial run to see how well it works. Next year is a presidential election. And that will be a large volume of people voting, although we hope a large volume votes now. But please pick this up and do take advantage of the early voting. And thank our candidates. Thank you very much.